All right. I think Iron. we made it. We made it. We made it. Yeah. <laughs> How's it um, going? Hi, Eamon. <laughs> Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Eamon Anderson with the Acumen America team. Uh, along with Acumen Academy, we're excited to bring you the second conversation in our leadership series on tackling poverty and racism in America. I couldn't be more excited today to be joined by Irma Ogwen, CEO of Bitwise Industries. This year has brought unimaginable hardship to so many and has stretched many of us to the breaking point. The COVID crisis has exposed vulnerabilities of our healthcare system and has disproportionately impacted low-income communities and communities of color, where Black and Latinx Americans have been infected at a rate over four times that of their white peers. The crisis has also left an economic crater that will take us years to recover from. COVID has exposed powerful disconnects. The S&P was higher yesterday than it was at its pre-COVID peak, yet unemployment, the unemployment rate is still over 10%. And while the crisis has emphasized troubling, and all while the crisis has emphasized troubling disparities, the unemployment rate for black workers is nearly 15% compared to 19, nine, compared to 9% for white workers. But these disparities aren't new. We have systematically failed black and Latinx communities for far too long. Since George Floyd's murder, millions of Americans have stood up for racial justice and many are working toward activism, action and reform. This moment of crisis has highlighted so many of the reasons we launched Acumen in America five years ago. We believe that we can rebuild from this crisis, that it will require entrepreneurial leaders who are tackling these broken systems and building towards a more equitable future. Leaders like Irma. We invested in Bitwise, not just because Irma and her team are reinventing tech training, not just because they're serving the sons and daughters of farm workers in the Central Valley, but because they're reimagining the future of underdog cities like Fresno, and tackling bias in tech head on. Um, I'm so excited to be here with Irma. She is an amazing entrepreneur and a super cool human being, as you will soon find out for yourself. Uh, and the goal of this conversation is to learn from Irma's journey, explore how race, racism, and racial justice have shown up for Bitwise, and to look forward toward Irma's vision for the future. Before I jump in, I, I want to acknowledge Acumen America's partners that have made this work possible. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, MetLife Foundation, Barclays, Autodesk Foundation, Dalio Foundation, QBE Foundation, Capital One, and Johnson & Johnson Foundation. Thank you. Irma and I will spend the next 40 minutes or so in conversation. Please be sure to raise any questions in the chat. My colleague, Catherine Casey Nanda, will join at the end of hour to bring those conversations to the discussion. All right. Now, on to the fun part. Hi, Irma. Hey, Irma. <laughs> Um, I wonder if you could get us started by just briefly setting the stage, introducing uh, yourself and, and Bitwise. Yeah, sure. So my name is Irma Olguin Jr. I have a suffix on my name. My mom has the exact same name that I do, so she likes to open my mail. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Bitwise Industries, um, as shown on this shirt here. Uh, we're headquartered in Fresno, California. Uh, and as Eamon said a minute ago, really what we are trying to do is remake the American city. Um, how do you rebuild in, in the country's hardest places um, and build the more just and equitable technology workforce that we've all been uh, hoping to see in, in this nation? So that is what we have been up to for seven going on eight years um, to great success and even more fun failures from time to time. Um, uh, but what we're doing is, is working. And so really, really excited to be here, uh, to talk to you, to uh, get to know the audience a little bit, and hopefully, you know, really get deep on, on what we're all facing today as a nation. Yeah, I appreciate that. Irma. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, strikes me about, you know, uh, your work is how deeply rooted it is in, in place mm -hmm. um, in Fresno. Folks are on the call from all over the country, all over the world. I wonder if you could paint us a picture of, of Fresno. What do we need to know about Fresno? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you asked because it's actually hard to describe sometimes. When you tell people that you're from Central California, I think, you know, they still think palm trees and, and you know, desert sun and ocean. And, and California, Central California is, is not that. Uh, and if you're looking for the technology industry in California, at least a decade ago, they would say it's over there in the Bay Area ish, you know, over there. Uh, but Central California is a really, really different place. And so what you got to know about Fresno and its valley is that we produce between 20 and 30 percent of the world's food. 
Um, it, it is a very, very lush place from the perspective of, of food, but it's an irrigated desert. So it's harsh in terms of sun, water is scare, scarce and on and on. Um, but what that should paint a picture uh, of for you in your mind is these giant swaths of ag land, right? Mm -hmm. Agriculture is and has been since forever, the driving industry, literally ever since the inception of this place. Um, and, and what that has sort of created from an economic standpoint is, I mean, little better than modern day feudalism, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking about folks who essentially own that land um, and who get to decide what happens on that land and then you've got the vast majority of folks who work that land um, and who are the laborers of that land. And so it's hard, I think, to sometimes, especially when I, when I tell people that I run a technology company, I think that you can immediately conjure this image of like a Google building or a Facebook level building, you know, it's shiny, it's beautiful. We weren't building that in Fresno, right? That's that's not the sort of we're, we're granaries, right? And <laughs> and warehouses and you know tractor repair shops and those types of things. That is really more the the speed of where we are situated, and that's where we where we began. That is the the heart and the um, heartbeat of Bitwise Industries and where we come from. Well, I've got that, you know, got the picture, you know, painted in bright colors. Thank you. <laughs> you know, one of the, uh, you know, thinking a little bit about this conversation was reading up on on Fresno. And I, I saw that Fresno was 90% white in 1970 and only 50% white today, while the Latinx population has tripled. You know, what's behind that rapid transformation of, of Fresno and how has that shaped the city? Yeah, yeah, the, you can attribute that again to agriculture, right? And if you can picture the folks who essentially, the, the number of folks who are owning land becomes fewer and fewer as that, that economy is consolidated, the ownership of land, right? Um, the labor that works on that land then basically has migrated from another, a number of places across the world to work that land. And so you end up with this majority minority situation many of which I would even say most of which are charged with the, the labor that makes the food that, that harvests the food that processes the food. Um, and, you know, n not for nothing. That's the, that's my origin story as well, right? Mm -hmm. That I come from a farm labor family. We migrated here from very, very South Texas to be slightly ambiguous about that. <laughs> um, migrated to follow the food, to follow the crops. Mm -hmm. And um, my grandparents, uh, my parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone that you could think of in my surrounding circle, all of us uh, used our hands to pick grapes and uh, uh, box peaches and to, you know, pack and, and ship and all of those things. Um, and that's the, that is not meant to be a hard luck story. That is literally the way most of us grow up uh, mm -hmm. in this region uh, and, and most by a wide margin. And, you know, that's, I mean, that, I really appreciate that story and I'm excited to, to hear a little bit more. And, you know, I wonder in Fresno, like, does that diversity become a melting pot or does that diversity become sort of like one side of the tracks, the other side of the tracks? How has that transformation sort of shown up in, in what the community looks like? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definite division, right? I mean, we're talking about, and you can see this in cities across the United States. It's not just Fresno, but I think we have one one of the most stark examples where the Latinx community picks the food, harvests the food, grows the food the black community of which there used to be a thriving sort of black business uh, corridor in Fresno was decimated when we, um, when we ran a freeway right through the town um, in, I want to say 1950, 1960. And so you've got this divide literally across the tracks um, where the black people live over there and the more affluent and white people live over there. And then over there out in the rural communities, that's where you find your Latinx population. And now to be fair, those are not the only uh, uh, ethnic or racial groups that we've got in our region, but that's sort of in rough strokes, broad strokes, how we are divided. Um, I will say that I went to school with a lot of really wonderful people um, from all walks of life, but it was very, very obvious, even at a, at a young age, that we were all living very different uh, lives and that our, our stories and the way that we would tell them in the future would be wildly different from each other. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd love to hear a little bit more about that, Irma. So, you know, from Carruthers across the country, back again, uh, serial tech founder, technologist in your own right, co-CEO of Bitwise. 
can you sort of walk us through that path? You know, leaving, coming back again, I think is, a, you know, both of those decisions I'm really curious about, how it felt to, you know, to leave Fresno and, and what inspired you to, to come back. Yeah, uh, uh, it's um, it's a wonderful story. I'll preface. <laughs> it's also hard, I think, sometimes to hear. So I, I but I'm happy to tell it because I think it's illustrative of why Bitwise exists. Um, and what we do today is really, I think, best understood through this this specific lens, this life story, right? And and so here it goes. I mean, I was born uh, and raised, like I said, in, in a very very small town, rural town. Um, uh, to the south and west of the city center, out in the fields. Like I was, I grew up around orchards and vineyards and I got my first job when I was six years old, uh, rolling raisins in the fields. And um, uh, so did everybody I knew, right? So just to be clear about that, every, my, my siblings, my cousins, everyone, uh, folks I went to school with, all got our, our first jobs at a very young age. And when you are surrounded in that way, when you start that young and when you're surrounded in that way, that does become the vision for your life, right? That becomes what you see yourself doing. It was more of that. And it was, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I knew it as I started to sort of get older, uh, somewhere around 10, 11, I realized, oh gosh, we're really poor, <laughs> you know? And, and it's really common to trade one bill for another so that you could, you know, stretch your dollars through, through the end of the month. And so, the vision for success uh, for me and the folks who grew up like me became paying all your bills in the same month. That became the gold standard for success. This is how you know you have made it is when you're not trading your rent for PG&E um, or, your, or your utility bill um, and you're not trading your you know, groceries for your car payment, right? Um, and that was the vision for success. And, and to, the, to that end, it was like, well, if I can get out of the fields, and I can work, grab a job at the local hardware store or gas station or what have you. And if I can work my way up to management, right? If I can get that far, I'll be able to pay all of my bills in the same month. I will be a success story. That is what I want for myself. Um, but uh, through a really like neat set of like moments that changed my life, um, I ended up accidentally going to college. Um, and when I say that it was an accident, like I'm really not, I'm really not kidding about that. It was 15, 16 years old. I'm a sophomore, I think. I think it was like the spring or maybe early junior year. And uh, I'm in a class in high school, and there's this this announcement over the PA system, uh, and it says basically like if you want to take the PSAT, you should report to the cafeteria. But I didn't, I was not college bound. I was not <laughs> planning on, I didn't know what the PSAT was. <laughs> but I'm 15 years old and I heard that I could get out of class for half a day if I went to the cafeteria. So I you left. Yeah. I, left. <laughs> I, I did what any 15 year old would do and I left. Um, and I sat for what would turn out to be the most important test I'd ever taken in my life. Um, and I did well on it. And I checked a box that said that I wanted to receive mail from colleges. And so it started arriving at my house. And in that pile of letters one day were some scholarship offers. Like, and there was a lot of mail. I mean, people are serious. When you check that box, like you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there were a couple of scholarship offers. And it was just like, you know, this like disorienting moment in time where it was like, wait a second, is college for people like me? Is this a possible thing for me too? And so I take this letter and it's a scholarship offer to a school in the Midwest, um, the University of Toledo. And I take this letter to my parents and I'm like, mom and dad, this has my name on it. <laughs> it's Dear Irma, come to school, here's a scholarship. You just have to show up to claim it. You know, basically that was the gist of it. And they, I mean, this I, I think is, is illustrative in the, the place that I grew up in and the time that I grew up in is they had the miserable job of having to look back across at me and say, we're really proud of you, but how are you going to get there? You know, how are you? I mean, this family has been roller, rolling around on a donut on the car for the last four or six weeks, hoping it doesn't go out. So we don't have to buy a new set of tires. How do you think you're going to get from here to, to the Midwest? And so anyway, the, as the story goes, my, my family sort of pitched in and we all collected cans and bottles all summer long and recycled them. And when there was enough change and dollar bills, 
uh, uh, to accomplish it, we, I bought a Greyhound bus ticket. And I rode, you know, 2,500 miles from Fresno, California to Toledo, Ohio, to show up at my first day of orientation and, and claim the scholarship. And um, which is, you know, like I said, the story of how I accidentally went to college. But let me not stop there. If, if, it's, if you'll indulge me, there's like another piece of this that I feel is really important. I also when I got there not knowing how the collegiate system worked like at all. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into. I did not know the system. It was like I had shown up, you know, in this new land and didn't speak the language. You know what I mean? And so I go to the registration uh, office for orientation and the woman behind the counter says, okay, great. Let me know what your major is gonna be so that I can send you to the correct orientation. And I didn't know what that was. I did not know what, um, again, not being college bound, how does, what does a major do for you? What is it, how does it work? So she explained it and uh, she hands me a catalog for the school and she, I'm flipping through it. And she says, this, you choose your major area of study and that is what you will spend your time on, you know, during your time here in, in Ohio. And uh, there was this beautiful glass building um, in, <laughs> in that catalog. And I'm 17, I'm across the country. I don't know anyone. I haven't heard a word of Spanish since I got off the bus. I haven't seen a taco truck anywhere in sight, you know? And so I'm looking through this catalog and I'm thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be awesome to take classes in this beautiful glass building? It's brand new and it's glass and I'm 17 and that's awesome, you know? And that turned out to be the College of Engineering that glass building was the College of Engineering. And so by accident, completely by accident, I became a computer engineer, uh -huh. uh, which would just radically and forever change my existence um, and, and would lead me down a path to what would eventually become Bitwise. But we can, we can get into those, those details in a bit. Um, it was just this, my first job in technology to sort of round out the story, my very first job in technology, I out earned everybody in my family. Um, from an hourly wage perspective. And I'm still, like I was still in school when I got this job, you know? And I think even then I realized it wasn't necessarily the schooling, but it was the industry and the standards of that industry, what you were expected to be able to accomplish in that industry. That was really, really important. Um, and I just knew that the technology industry had the power and the room to take on people like me and change their lives. And so, you know, sort of, there are a lot of moments that I can describe on the journey from there to here, but ultimately what that became was, I have to figure out how to give this feeling to more people. You mm -hmm. know, um, I have to figure out how to take what Ohio gave me and, and bring it home. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and like I said, there fits and starts between here and there, but eventually it became Bitwise Industries. That's amazing. I really appreciate you sharing that story. and. Um, you know, I guess that, I mean, that last piece is really interesting to me. I mean, how, I, you know, admire that, you know, you sort of had been able to achieve what you achieved and wanted to sort of create a pathway that worked for more. How does that intention turn into Bitwise? It, yeah, well, it was this, there was this moment when I was working late once with a bunch of engineer friends and I, and, and you know, the technology industry has historically been really, segregated or divided in terms of gender, right? And, you know, all of my colleagues were male and then there, here was I, not, <laughs> not that. Um, and so we decided to order this pizza. We were working late one night. We decided to have a pizza delivered. And one of my colleagues comes to uh, collect cash and I give him a 20 and he goes to pay the, for the, the delivery. And uh, he yells back from the door. He says, how much do you want to leave for the tip? And I yell back to him, tell him to keep the change. Uh, which the the way that the world stood still for an entire minute and the cold wash of realization in my body was that I had never ever in my life not counted the change, right? I had never wondered whether or not I needed that extra buck 50 for a, an extra gallon of gas or, you know, whatever. Um, and in addition to that, I had just, I had just helped the pal out with an extra couple of bucks, you know, and, and, I felt so powerful. I can't even tell you, Eamon. I felt so powerful. And so it just became really obvious that we had to, we had to find a way, like you said, to give more people that feeling of power, that feeling of agency. I get to choose. And so 
we really, so I ended up coming back to the Central Valley from the Midwest um, with the specific intention, like I have to figure out a way to make this happen. And there were lots of pieces, but eventually it became, when you sort of look back on the story I just told, and if, if you think to yourself, I really want to change the world, but you can't wait for this story to happen again and again. How do you recreate the setting of that story? Um, it comes down to three things. It comes down to technology education. How do you get more folks into technology education when most, if not, you know, I would say overwhelmingly, uh, they're not receiving letters accidentally for a scholarship, right? Um, so what does it look like to really teach technology education for so folks who are coming from that story of poverty, the sons and daughters of migrant farm workers, the um, uh, folks who are leaving the oil industry, the sort of these antiquated industries that are changing so rapidly, how do you actually do that? Um, and then the second thing is like a sense of place. That glass building was not a small thing for me. That was actualizing my experience. That was putting, sitting in a beautiful place, feeling as though not just that I belonged there, but that this was a signal of what my life could be like. Uh, and so that sense of place, that clubhouse is really, really important. Um, and then the third thing was proof, industry, that job, right? That, that job where I was out earning everybody in my family. Those three things, when you do them in that order, mm -hmm. really do lead to thousands of people who are achieving that sense of agency, that moment where the world stands still and they think, I'm gonna make my car payment this month and my rent, you know, and that's that's huge. That's what Bitwise does. You know, it's not it's not inevitable that the company takes on all of that. I mean, each you know, building yeah. the cleaning model, building the space, creating the jobs, you know, it, that those are complex and distinct. How did you know why do all that in under the umbrella of one firm? You know, why is all that Bitwise's job? You know, I think that's exactly why and thank you for letting me paint that picture, right, of what the Central Valley is like or what Fresno is like. But when you are in what we call underdog cities, it's really not implicit. It's You cannot assume that somebody's going to do the other thing. Even if you train people and give them or help them attain technology skills, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a club, clubhouse to go to. That doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to interview and get the job and or and or that they have the network to help them get that job. Um, and so you really do have to, in a place like uh, Fresno um, and other underdog cities across the United States, you really do have to lift from all sides. Um, you are taking it all on. If you're taking on the whole human being in that journey, you're taking all of those pieces on and you've got to be at least moderately good at each of them. Right. You know, it sounds, I mean, I sort of, when you put it like that, it's clear that like these are really necessary and complimentary, but I, I wonder if they ever feel like they're in tension. You know, does it ever feel like it's hard to hold, you know, that, that place and hard to hold that training and hard to hold that sort of job creation, that proof? Like what kind of tension shows up when you're trying to pull these like different and necessary parts together? Most, I mean, there are lots of, lots of places where you find tension. Mostly it's in people not believing you. <laughs> you know, I think that's, mo that's a big one. That, um, you know, when we started was, um, I can't, I, the number of times we, we would hear like the technology industry, why would you wanna try to make that work in Fresno? Like it's over there, it's two and a half hours to the north and west. Bay Area's over there, friends, you know? Um, and it was uh, overlooking the experience of the human being, you know, the human being who doesn't necessarily want to leave. Like, why should we be telling all of our youngest, brightest, most ambitious people that if you want to do your highest and best, you have to go somewhere else? Right. That's a bad message to send people, you know? And so, yeah, I think the, there are lots of places where you find the tension. The complexity, the complexity of the business is only complex when you peel it apart. It's not at all complex when you think about the experience of the human being and how they're going to achieve their version of success in this industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so, then it just becomes, they're almost like shims, you know? You're just like, you're just helping things get straight. <laughs> That's it, that's all you're doing is keeping, keeping folks on a path. I think that's a really interesting idea, right? If you sort of imagine them as business models, they seem sort of distinct and separate. If you imagine around your customer, around the learner, you know, the community that you're serving, these things have to be together. And if they're not stitched together, 
people aren't going to be able to sort of have that transformative experience. Um, right. You know, who has come to that place? You know, you built this thing. You know, who has come to it? You know, what does that community uh, that, you know, of Bitwise look like today? Yeah, it's it's been a real fun ride and we are we're growing really, really rapidly. Uh, what we're doing is is working largely. Um, and so we've trained um, uh, over 4,000 students. Um, 1,000 new technology jobs have been created um, in Fresno. That, we have found homes for all of that. So about 250,000 square feet of uh, technology campus in our downtown. Um, all of it was, used to be blighted buildings, right? It used to be a really sort of sad sight to see. 200 different technology companies have chosen to locate on our campus to be around that talent. Uh, but I think the, the biggest thing for us is that that new technology workforce that's being created, created, excuse me, is really representative of the county. Meaning that if we are majority minority, so is the technology workforce. If we are 50% female and or gender non-conforming, so is that technology workforce. Um, and our, our statistics match, right? So we actually are greater than 50% minority, greater than 50% um, female or gender non-conforming, 20% first generation. Um, those are the statistics, statistics of our county. Those are the same folks who are getting the opportunity. And that, I mean, for us, that's the biggest piece. The, the biggest piece is, you know, if you, look at, if you look at what other cities have done, other technology hubs, they have also used the technology industry as this economic driver, as this like stepping stone on which to build their economy. Only the way that they have done it has really excluded 90% of the population, right? And so we don't want to make that same mistake. If we're going to build a place where you can be a technologist and do your highest and best uh, in your home, right? Uh, then it's got to, the, the whole thing has to look like what your population looks like. And we're really, really proud of that. We think that that is literally the way um, that we can recover from all of the things that we're experiencing today via this pandemic and economic collapse and one calamity after another, right? Right. So what does recovery look like? We think it looks like this. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, just to underline, I mean, there's so much there, Irma. I mean, to underline a couple of things. I mean, creating that many tech, I mean, the, the largest employer in Fresno, you know, again to my, you know, uh, I've got a lot smarter on Fresno this week. So I've got all the <laughs> Fresno facts for you. <laughs> uh, but the largest employer in Fresno has like, like 5,000 employees. And you guys are creating with like what a thousand, you know, you create, you're, you are sort of creating like meaningful changes to what the workforce in this community looks like. And I just think that's really, really powerful. Like this is, you know, changing the shape of, the economy and the community, uh, you know, in this place, which in, in, a, in a way that's really exciting. And, but the other thing is, you know, like this isn't just a story about, I mean, and part of that's, that's what we got excited about. This is a story about transforming Fresno and beyond, mm -hmm. but it's also a story about changing people's lives. I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, how your, your path, uh, you know, has, was transformative. You know, what does it look like? What does it look like for somebody coming into a GeekWise class and coming out of a GeekWise class? And like, how does that show up and, and, and how has that been transformative, you know, to the folks that, that you're serving? Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the things that we don't want to miss is, you know, if we take my life experiences and those of other folks, and, and you don't have to be a farm laborer to experience this, right? Like that's not, that is not requisite to the, to the experience of coming from a story of either being overlooked or underrepresented or um, a story of any sort of um, marginalized community. Um, but what you what is common in all of those stories is that we never received the invitation, hmm. right? We never received the invitation to be a part of something that was not directly in front of us. And so something that, that we really focus on is going out and meeting those people. Like, act, like we will send people to churches and to high school rallies and to, you know, um, bake sales. Like we will go meet car washes. We will go meet the people where they are and tell them about this thing and make sure that they are receiving and hearing loudly the invitation that, hey, we built this for you and you should come see. No, no obligation. Let's not like commit to each other. And I'm not saying that you're going to be, you know, a $75,000 a year computer engineer in four weeks. I'm not making you promises, but come see if this is for you. And you should know that via this invitation that, that you're welcome here, right? That no one belongs here more than you do. And so that became a large part of how we navigate and who, how we sort of figure out um, 
it all, all of it comes down to who comes in the front door. You know, if you have a diverse set of folks walking through the front doors, it's going to be a diverse set of folks who end up working in those buildings, you know? And, um, and so that's sort of step one. Step two is then trying it out. How do you, in a non-threatening way, in a way that doesn't disrupt or overturn your life, how do you experience the technology industry? And so we believe really, really deeply in students having the opportunity to self-select in, right? So we don't gate, like that's one of the important things. We do not gate for the top 1% or the top 2% of, you know, a technology class and only those folks get to participate. It's like, you have to read and write uh, in either English or Spanish. You have to be able to divide by three and you have to have an ardent interest in wanting to be a technologist or some, some version of technology. And then we have pathways for each of those, each of the <laughs> lily pads that come next. Um, maybe important to that though is in our experience, aptitude for technology has nothing there is zero correlation between whether or not you will be successful in the technology industry and whether or not you come in with any sort of skill. What actually matters is whether or not life will allow you to practice. Like, do you have childcare? Right. Do you, can you uh, figure out how to navigate the bus system? Um, do you have a work schedule uh, or classes that accommodate a work schedule? Um, it's those sort of supported, what are in many cases called supportive services. It's those supportive services and doing that well that really matters. Because what that comes down to, Eamon, is you and I blocking and tackling so that somebody can practice. That's what it comes down That's all it really comes down to. We did not figure out a new and different way to teach JavaScript, right? Like we don't have some patented formula for cramming that into your head faster or better than anyone else. Lots of people teach JavaScript. What we do do better than I would say most other folks on the planet um, is that we know that greater than 50% of the struggle is having somebody on your side who's going to block and tackle for you while you practice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, really powerful idea. I mean, we also invest in healthcare and I thought a lot about the social determinants of health, right? You know, housing and hunger and childcare and uh, job security and all those things affect your your health, right? Mm -hmm. I think the same is true for work. There's these social determinants of work and to expect that someone with barriers of transportation, uh, you know, barriers of childcare, barriers of food insecurity is gonna be able to upskill, find that job and, and, and navigate mobility. It just doesn't happen. And so, you know, you have to be able to incorporate, you know, those social determinants of work into a model like what you're building. You know, one of the, I really love the this sort of like idea at Bidwise around no one belongs here more than you. You know, it's it's such a powerful, simple and powerful idea. And when you meet anybody, when I've met anybody I've met that's a part of the Bitwise family, like that kind of like ethos like shines, shines bright. You know, that's not the same culture you know, everywhere. And you can't create every technology job for every graduate of, of GeekWise. You know, how how do you, you know, how do you, how do you think about preparing you know, your graduates, many of whom are learners of color, to move into these predominantly white, predominantly male spaces? You know, what does, you know, how do you think about um, making, you know, really preparing folks for that, for that transition in an industry that's just not where it needs to be? I think there are a couple of things to that. It's really important. And I'm actually interested in your experience here too, because you do work around the world where, you know, there are lots of factors that play into a person's ability to get to a yes, right? And whether it's in health or if it's in food or if it's in technology, what are the, what do, what is, what are the true contributing factors, right? I think it's really easy to throw up like this wall of, of that's the way the system is, but like, what is the system made out of? What are the, what is re where do we really have to get a yes along the journey for that student in order for them to have an opportunity at the job, right? There's a couple of things. There's obviously in hiring management, right? Like we have to have folks who are uh, relatively sensitive to looking for diverse candidates. Um, and you have to have a set of proof that you can do the work, right? And you, in most cases, got to be able to find somebody who will make an introduction for you. Like those three things are when you look, when you peel them apart, you can attack them one at a time. You can do that. We can block and tackle in that way. Um, and I think that it, it is um, really, really important when a student comes through our doors that they are aware that they are not 
on an easy road, but that every step of the way we have their backs, right? And that uh, we have this, you know, wonderful story about this student, and it's also an awful story, story, right? But we have this wonderful story of a student who got their first job. There are actually two students, uh, but one of them got their first job, and on the way to the first day of work, blew a tire. Hmm. Not having a cell cell phone, not you know, really having the luxury of that, didn't call, and so it looked like a no call, no show, and he was terminated on the spot. First day of work. Incredibly common, right? For something, for life, literally to get in your way right. of holding on to that opportunity. And it did take a phone call from one of us, from somebody on our team to call that employer and be like, bro, he's gonna need a second chance. I know you're not inclined and that's not your system to give a second chance, but it's it's time to loosen your purse strings and to change your standard a little bit because this is actual life that's happening. and. You know, there was some reticence there and there's some pushback and there's some sort of uh, cultural education that has to happen. Um, but that's what it comes down to is like sometimes you've got to put yourself out there and say like this guy or gal or whomever deserves this chance. And the, your system, uh, which was set up for good reason, the no call, no show is a pretty serious infraction in any workplace, right? Um, but your system is automatically throwing, like you're literally taking this life story that is not fraught with second chances and saying you you literally don't get any, like you don't get any second chances. And we don't uh, believe in that, first of all. Um, and we think that every situation is so fundamentally different um, uh, that when we do look at each of those three factors that play a role in how a person or if a person is able to achieve their version of success, like we, we get to do something about it. We have the power to do something about it. And I, um, yeah, like I said, that is our experience in technology and the the sort of things that people are up against in order to really like have that first opportunity or maybe even their second opportunity. But I imagine you have to have had experiences like that all around the world and every sort of context is, is how do we give folks more than one shot at a thing? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a, um, I think that's that's exactly right. You know, one of the things I, I didn't hear you talk about is like the pipeline problem. And I feel like, you know, we, you know, that that's something that you, I, you, I hear a lot when you, when you, when you talk to, you know, some of the, the large tech firms that talk about, you know, pipeline as the challenge. I didn't come up. You didn't mention pipeline as the, as the issue. Like what, like, how do you, what do you make of that? Is that, is that real, you know, how do we distribute? If, it, if not, what do we do about it? You're gonna make me upset, Eamon. <laughs> You're gonna make me upset. I think I think it's a bullshit problem. Okay, I think it's a bullshit answer. Uh, uh, I think what actually. So here's the thing, and I think it was 2014. The major technology companies first published their diversity statistics about who was employed in their in their companies and. It was really, really loud to everyone uh, that fewer than 10% or less, excuse me, less than 10% uh, was a, a minority, right? And less than 10% or I think it was like 12% or something was female. And so everybody said, oh, this is a huge problem, right? This is a huge problem. That was six years ago. <laughs> if it was a pipeline problem, then we would have fixed that then, hmm. right? In, in that period of time, Billions of dollars, and I'm not exaggerating, billions of dollars have been spent on recruiting and hiring to apparently, presumably, allegedly fix this problem. And we have made a 1% difference so far, right? A 1% difference in those statistics, meaning uh, Black and Latinx were between 2 and 3% of the technology workforce in the large companies in the world. Uh, and six years later, we're now between three and 4%. Hmm. Okay, billions of dollars and six years. It's not a pipeline problem. It's that either we are really, really bad at this or they're lying. Like the, <laughs> those are our options at this point. And if we wanted to fix the pipeline problem, the resources exist to do that. The money exists to do that. The human power exists to do that, but we are, letting that be the scapegoat to the answer of why we don't have a more di diverse and inclusive technology workforce. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad. That's I'm, just my, my I'm, glad, I'm glad I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, this has been an intense year. Um, 
And you know, you're running a business that you know was you know six months ago, eight months ago, was offering in-person training, um, expansion to multiple cities on you know the books, the big real estate portfolio. Um, you know how what how has how have you how are you guys holding up? Like how has COVID impacted your work? And then also, given the fact that you're serving disproportionately black and brown communities, you know how has the death of George Floyd shown up in that community? And how do you see? Uh, the role of it wise, you know, in really advancing issues of racial justice. You just, that was like 11 questions. So I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot more to go. I got so many more questions for everyone. So, you know, that's the first of seven 11 part questions. So, you know, <laughs> no, listen, I mean, we're, we're extremely community and place based, right? I think you heard me tell the story about how important those things are that sense of place, the clubhouse, the people surrounding you, or you who are all rooting for your success. Those are required parts if we're going to change the story. Required, right? And so overnight, 60% of our business literally didn't work anymore. Like it just stopped working. Uh, we all went to shelter in place in California and there goes, we were doing 40 events in our building uh, every week. Right. And we were, I mean, the community was thriving and bustling and all these things. And then like straight halt, just like complete full stop. Um, but our, the, the team that we built, the community that we built, they, we have this mantra and you can see it on, you know, Slack channels and emails and it's, it's hashtag put me in coach, um, which is like this culture on our team where folks are just like, show me how to help. Like point me in a direction where I can be useful in this moment and we're gonna do it. So we, on the, on literally, so we went to shelter in place on a Thursday, uh, the company decided and then the state order was released on a Friday. Um, that weekend we began, we asked ourselves, what do we owe the world at the moment? Like what is our, how should we be contributing to our community in this, in this now very obviously close to home pandemic? And we said, we're gonna, we're gonna deliver groceries to the elderly and immunocompromised. Um, and folks who used to do events and used to do front desk work and used to do you know, um, all of these things, we're, that doesn't exist anymore. So we're gonna organize and figure out how to get food to folks who can't shop. Uh, they can't go out. Um, and so you know, I can't even, I mean, it was one of those beautiful moments when it was just like everybody on Slack and email was like, put me in coach, put me in coach. Uh, and so we did that and we delivered in, uh, it was like three months time. We just delivered like three quarter, three quarters of a million, uh, meals to seniors and to immunocompromised. Um, and that was just the beginning. And then we, we realized that, you know, our friends and neighbors were shutting down their businesses and furloughing em employees. And I'm literally talking about folks who like tenants in our buildings, coffee shops in our buildings, were sending their employees home to not come back ever. And so we said, and, and, and while that's happening, like you're getting the text message from the shop owner that they're sending everybody home and they, they, don't, they won't be coming back. That same moment, you're getting a Twitter alert that Amazon is surge hiring for you know, 70,000 drivers or something along those lines in California. It was like, shouldn't these things meet? <laughs> shouldn't, those, shouldn't these employees and these, uh, or these former employees and these job uh, needs like meet in the middle somewhere? Shouldn't we match them together? And so we, we built onwardus.org, which was, is really just a matchmaking platform for uh, folks who are leaving one um, typically hourly wage uh, job to another, right? And, um, and then we, we built software that helped us deliver groceries better. And we built software to help us match jobs better. And now we launched PodUp, which is podupnow.com, which is like how families can get connected to other families to share childcare responsibilities. Um, and it's really like you take what's happening around you and you take a, you pivot really, really hard to try to meet that need in the moment. And you get all of these folks on your team who have um, a mind uh, for a life of service. And they say, how can I help accomplish making my neighbor's life better right now? And that's what Bitwise has become in the last six months. Um, and whether it is, you know, food insecurity, uh, or if it is joblessness that we are facing, 10% unemployment, it's even bigger in the Central Valley, I'm sure you can imagine. Folks are dying, folks are very sick. Everyone is asking, how can I help, right? And that is up to and including, how can I safely go out and protest, right? right? And what does my company think about me going out and safely protesting? And do we have support at the highest level from the company to take a couple of days because 
you know, I mean, the number of uh, black men or black Americans who have been um, unduly punished for just existing uh, continues to be like this very, very heavy thing that we talk about and face on our team. And does the CEO and the co-CEO and the president, do they feel that? And are they part of um, that sorrow and that pain? And I think, I hope that what we have demonstrated in the last six months is that we very much are um, and that we very much support the existence of people as it has changed so radically during this period of time. Um, and that it doesn't matter if there's a pandemic happening, still no one belongs here more than you. It is really hard to be the one who has to jump into this conversation <laughs> because uh, I mean, we might need a part two. The audience is incredibly engaged and um, tons of questions for you, but thank you for such a great conversation and for sharing so much of yourself and your story. Um, actually, before we go to the audience, I'm going to steal a question for myself, which is when we were prepping for this session, you talked about Bitwise's plans for expansion to new cities and would love to hear where that is, what you're thinking about and how this community can help you. And then would also love going to tag in a second question to hear about, we talked a little bit about what gives you hope for the future in the context of, of Bitwise and your expansion. Yeah, um, the multi-part questions that you all are about. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna talk about them after. <laughs> well, you, when you feel them so well, they're going to keep coming at you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so in terms of expansion, so we are in Fresno. We started in Fresno. We expanded to Bakersfield, Merced, and then Oakland, uh, in, uh, in particular West Oakland. Um, and we will make that announcement later this year uh, about West Oakland. So you 118 people are the first to know. Um, and, uh, and we chose those places uh, in the same way we're gonna choose the rest, the, the next six. And we, that is like, Bitwise was built out in the desert, right? We are a company that behaves much like a cactus. We're gonna survive the harshest possible places, but we are really not made for anything that's lush, right? We're not made to go into, um, you know, the, the best and the most rich parts of Silicon Valley or the center of Manhattan. We are made to go to places where we can actually do some good where we can have a real impact. And we're looking at things like um, uh, per capita income uh, because where per capita income is artificially depressed, the technology industry can provide a really big lift, right? So if the average hourly rate for an adult in that place is $17 an hour and you put them in an entry level technology job, it's not unheard of to double if not triple that wage. Um, and so that Delta, that impact is really, really, really important to us. We, uh, we do have a, a short list of about 12 cities that we're looking at uh, to roll out in the next three years, two years. Um, we have six that are sort of closer to our hearts, but we're evaluating them. And really what it comes down to, what we're asking ourselves is, can we go to that place and make a difference? Uh, will it matter to Baltimore, to El Paso, to Milwaukee, to Memphis, to um, what we call sort of underdog cities? Will it matter if there's a bit wise there? And can we can we put a thousand people in jobs in five years? Uh, can we train folks who come from underrepresented or overlooked backgrounds and put them into the technology? Well, we don't put them, let me be very clear. They earn their technology and employment, but can we help uh, kick rocks out of the road um, on that pathway so that we can change what that technology industry in that place looks like and feels like? And in some cases, that industry may not even exist and we're interested in that too. So those are the sort of the things that we're looking at uh, for for expansion uh, that feel important to us at the moment. Um, and yes, the places that I listed are actually on the short list. Baltimore, uh, uh, El Paso, Milwaukee, Memphis, uh, Detroit, Tacoma, um, and a few others. Uh, and then your second question was what? I lost Around it. the future, you know, sort of in this, this challenge time, how what gives you hope for the future? Mm. You know, you, you don't want it to take a movement. You know, you don't want it to take the Black Lives Matter movement. You don't, you definitely don't want there to be as much unrest um, as there is today. But if you're looking for the silver lining, and I always do, um, the world is really looking at these injustices differently now and they're paying more attention to them. And even though we've sort of been at this work for a long time and we've developed this track record, Bitwise has never made more sense than it makes today, you know? Uh, and so not, and not just from a justice lens, but also from an economic recovery lens. You know, if we're all thinking about how we get out of this hole, 
right? How we get out of this hole, you start to think about uh, reskilling or upskilling. You start to think about um, industries that are not going away um, uh, or, and or are gonna come back really, really strong. Um, and technology is one of those. So that's upward mobility, high growth, high wage jobs, plenty of them and an ability to get folks skilled into them relatively quickly. I mean, we're not, we're not creating certainly rocket scientists and we're definitely not making surgeons, right? But we can build a set of technology skills in six, 12, 18 months um, uh, that, is, that really matches right around the time when we're all asking for a new set of entry level employees coming out of this thing. Um, Bitwise makes a lot of sense in that context too. So I feel hopeful and we are getting a lot of validation uh, from a potential new administration um, uh, here in November and then January um, that what Bitwise is doing is really applicable on a national level and could take the work that we're doing and make it sort of implicit in what recovery looks like. So I'm encouraged by that. Thanks. Uh, so we have a question from Sabrina in New York who um, asks, where do partnerships play a role in Bitwise's model? What could companies that are already in these underdog cities be doing differently? This is another multi-part one. Uh, and are you seeing more willingness to collaborate rather than compete during these very trying, trying times in the US? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, so partnerships are a really big deal because we're not going to be able to do, we can't answer every um, civic need, uh, at least not yet. Um, so when it comes to childcare, for example, uh, or navigating the mass transit system in a given place, there are partners that already do that well. And so we really do spend a lot of time building those linkages between our company and those sometimes their CBOs, nonprofits, um, uh, uh, sometimes they're for profits, just sort of depends, those in institutions. But that's not enough. Like it's not enough to put a logo on a page and say, hey, we're partners with, you know, uh, Rural Transit Co. Like that's not enough. Now it is, now how do I tell my students to use this? Like how do I help them navigate the benefit of what you offer? And so that actually does take a lot of work, like it's actually a lot of work to first understand the system and then be able to help other people uh, take advantage of those things. And so that's one way that we leverage partnerships. I think on the education side, that's another thing that's really important to us. Uh, we have really great and deep relationships with all the traditional educational institutions in our regions. So for, whether it is at the, the kindergarten, high school or collegiate level, we create deliberately relationships with that entire sort of pipeline, and I, I'm using that in air quotes, uh, to, uh, so that uh, when college or that particular system may not be right for a student, but is more right for us, or the other way around, when there's, we see a student who maybe is a better fit for a computer science program or, or something along those lines, those relationships really matter. And being able to sort of go to those deans and say, we want you to come and speak in a class or we want to send some of our people to speak in your classes and having that relationship. So you're not really competing. It's really about finding the most um, appropriate pathway for any given human being and making sure that they know that there are options and it doesn't have to be just this one thing. So uh, those are two specific ways that we use partnerships. Thanks. Um, Josh had a question. He says he's often in Bitwise hashtag specifically. When you walk in, Bitwise's culture shows up in every interaction and corner of the building. How do you foster that culture and ensure Bitwise's values show up everywhere from the art on the walls to the vendors being used all the way to the conversation happening in common spaces? Uh, yeah, good question. Hey, Joshua. <laughs> that's, uh, that's actually really important and this matters, right? So something that, um, that we focus a lot on uh, is what does it feel like when you come into one of our buildings? Because the worst thing that we can do, uh, from one of the worst things that we can do from my perspective, is to build places where, where folks who grew up like me feel like they don't belong, right? And so that sort of subconscious level of self-selecting in or self-selecting out of a place matters so much. I can tell you that today, and I probably, you know, I have, have experienced the biggest delta in life in terms of socioeconomic class, right? Um, and I can tell you that today I still walk into places where I feel like I don't belong there, you know, um, and, and to events where I feel like I don't belong there. I don't want to do that to the people that we serve. So it's really, really important from the music you hear to the way that you're greeted uh, to what you see when you first walk in our doors. We pay attention to all of those things. Um, and with that sort of results, or if you take one step, another layer back, 
what that means is that hiring is really, really important to us. You've got to hire people who believe in that as much as you do, right? You've got to hire people. And this is literally one of the things that we talk about during interviews is you have to be as invested, if not more invested in somebody's, somebody else's success uh, than your own. Um, and if that doesn't jive, if that doesn't feel comfortable for you, if you can't willingly say that out loud um, easily, no harm, no foul, but this isn't going to be the place for you. Um, and so that matters a lot. And there's a related question on how you create intentional community that this inter so that such that interconnectedness doesn't rely on the, the word they use is organic happenstance. So how will Bitwise's created workforce continue to be a community that creates opportunities beyond Bitwise? And I think you actually have some good examples of this in reality, but would love to hear that as well. Yeah, well, I think uh, the things that we build matter. The events that we hold matters. How we continue to communicate with you matters. And I think here's the, here's the thing um, that would be really easy to overlook. Uh, uh, earlier I said that it matters that we go out to the churches and it matters that we go out to the rallies and, it, you know, all of those things that we sponsor the pizza party for the little league, you know, baseball community in a rural town somewhere. Those things matter because that's where the people are. Right. But you can't extend an invitation only once, you know, you have to extend it again and again and again and constantly being uh, inviting people back to be part of that community for them to level up, but also to encourage the leveling up of the people around them, right? And so the, our, um, one of the things that we didn't mention earlier, but our greatest recruiting tool um, in our classes, for our classes, um, is the success of the student. They'll bring back four more people from their communities to come and experience the win that they just experienced. And so while we will go out there and extend that invitation the first time, you still have to invite them back again and again to invite the folks that they want to bring, right? And sort of those sort of concentric uh, circles of, of network matters, but you can't just do it once. It's got to be constant and you've got to make sure that people feel like they belong there. Thanks, we're unfortunately at time and I'm going to hand back to Eamon for the final word, but um, just so proud to have you in our community, Eamon. I'm hoping that this community can also help as you think about or as, not as you think about, as you start to expand across the country, because we need Bitwise in every underdog city. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, Irma, um, so much gratitude for who you are as a human being, the work that you're leading at, at Bitwise for bringing these stories, you know, your, all that you've learned to this community and this conversation. And, um, you know, part of what we're trying to do with these conversations is both really underlying you know, how we're going to build back better, how we're going to address uh, the poverty and racism that are persistent in this country. And it's leaders like you and the work that you're doing that's gonna take us there. And this conversation and um, really fills me with hope. And I thank you for taking the time. No, hey, I really appreciate being able to tell our story. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, Acumen as a partner of ours, as an investor of ours, I mean, you've gotta have people around the table who believe in these things as much as you do and uh, Acumen does, and we appreciate you a great deal. So thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Irma. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everyone.